we're now moving into the uh, panel session. Now, in Australia, there's a, well, there used to be a show called The Price is Right. Um, and at the beginning, it'd be do, 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 and all the people would be cheering, and you go, you know, Jenny Jones, come on down. And we'll go, yay, she'll be running down, go, yay. We're not going to quite do that. But what I'm going to call out <laughs> is the name. <laughs> but you guys all have to cheer, and the bands, they've just gone off for a drink. And, um, so I'm going to call up the six people who are our panellists for today. Um, Bev's already on her way. Um, Laurent, are you around? And we've got Claire. Okay, I'll go quick, quick, quick. Um, Claire, yep, and Jasper, and Al. I feel like I'm winning a register out. And Luke. So what we're doing is um, we've asked you to give us some questions and things on Slido. And so these are the questions. Smart is managing it. Um, and uh, magically, I don't quite know how you're doing this, but anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I don't understand how that's talking to that. It's amazing. Modern technology. Um, great. All right. So, what we're going to do is not everybody's going to answer every question. So, so what we're not going to have is that person number one says this, person number two says this, and so on, because that can actually be quite repetitive. So, what we're going to do is first of all ask each of the panelists to just very briefly say who they are and what they do, just so you know where, what kind of where they're coming from to this. To this, and then I'll ask the questions that are coming up. And if you feel that you wish to um, to respond to that question, just respond. And it doesn't matter if all six of you want to respond to a question. That's not prohibited, but it's not the format we're going to follow for each question. So. Um, Perhaps if we start with you, Claire, if you just want to say who you are and uh, we... Sorry, I'm so uh, the, uh, here on our mic, so we're going to have to... Yep. Sorry. Uh, so, hello, I'm uh, Claire Stang. I uh, spoke in the uh, second panel session last afternoon. Um, the second group. <coughs> and I work for Facebook and Twitter. Um, I Okay, so you guys keep that one and you, you share that one. Yep. Hello, I'm Ed Jones from Lincoln. I'm a plastic professor of marine institution thinking. I <laughs> run a repository of research data management for the communication team. Now, they're not being um, amplified. Is everyone able to hear everybody or do we need to ask the group to, s to speak up a bit? Up a little bit, okay, yes, if you wouldn't mind, sorry. The mic doesn't have to stay on the table, so if you just pick it up and speak to it as though it's a normal mic, that's fine. <laughs> I'll be brief. Um, my name is Jasper Megan, data steward at uh, KU Delft. <coughs> uh, hello, my name is Lauren Gatto. I'm a computer computational biologist and a PR in systems biology here at the University of Cambridge. Um, I'm a data champion here in Cambridge. I'm an instructor in the software and data carpentry um, initiatives um, at Software Sustainability Institute. Um, fellow and an open activist. Uh, my name is Nico Haidt. I work at EPFL in Switzerland and uh, I'm a scientific advisor. So I'm basically an independent consultant on uh, everything open, trying to find out what the institution should start as an initiative to improve the impact of the CISA collective. Excellent. Okay, so we've got a range of people who come from different places who also have different roles within their institutions. So the first question that's come up is, um, well, it's phrased as, how do, we, how do we engage those who are disengaged and see RDM as pointless bureaucracy? So I don't know if that's an experience that any of you have had. I don't know, we've got somebody who's already ready to. Yeah. Uh, so one of the things we are doing is talking to researchers who might not want to talk to us, basically to the financial administration. Whenever there's a new project, a name pops up with all sorts of information, and we contact them. We contact them and start talking to them about their research. And that's the way you engage with people who you wouldn't necessarily be proactive about it. Now, the responses are varying. Some people are annoyed, why are you contacting me? And other people are enthusiastic and there are people that you need to convince. But in order to get those who aren't uh, necessarily already interested, um, you need to go towards them and find a way to figure out um, 
who is working on preferably uh, a new project rather than halfway in between because we heard today a lot of uh, good research data management needs to be done in the beginning of the project. Is there anything others wish to add to that question or success stories they might have had? Yeah? Um, we found they, um, it's been quite, sorry, can you hear me? Can you just hold it closer? Yeah. yeah. Um, we found it quite successful. First of all, if people approach us for any reason, um, so, for example, if somebody wants their, their output sorted out, we talk about data. If we're in a room with them, we talk about data for whatever reason. Uh, and the other is that we try and um, talk to people in their functional groups. We try and talk to people when they're with people they research with, because then they're thinking about their work rather than administration. Um, uh, the the, the take-home really being that people don't want to talk about data in the abstract. If you just want to, see, if you just say to people, we want to talk about your data, they're not really, you know, they tick the box and move on. Whereas if they're thinking about their work, then they incorporate what you what you tell them into what they're doing. Which is quite similar to the previous yeah, approach as well, is. isn't it? Yeah. So, Laurent, did you want to add to that? Uh, let me reformulate it. Um, in other words. Uh, researchers often have a really big ego and they are very keen to talk about their research because their research is obviously the most important research in the world. So if you ask them to talk about their research and you know, give them the possibility to say how important they are and you know, that they are a complete expert in the field, they will be very happy to come and talk to you. And that maybe is the right time to ask them a question about, what about your data. <laughs> right, okay, excellent. Um, now, the next question is talking about a, a, an example of good practice, which is that UCL c now considers open practices in its academic careers framework. And so the question is, have others considered doing the same, or what steps are you taking to reward researchers for this sort of behaviour, for this sort of open behaviour? Or you might wish to talk about barriers. That's another way of approaching this question. So this is about rewarding open data practice or good research data practice? I, I'm not sure I have an answer for that, but it's one of the scenarios we use because um, in, in research data management workshops, we talk about what happens because I, have a, I try to learn from what my researchers tell me. Uh, we had a researcher who basically lost a section of her career because she moved institutions and fell out with a researcher. And so we talk about evidencing your, your career by other methods than, and securing that evidence through other methods than ethics. So Claire, you were talking in your talk about, um, <laughs> sorry to put you on the spot, about a new process you're working with uh, that you're asking your researchers to, to follow in terms of data practice and, and, and um, notation and so on. I, I, is that tied in any way to, to, you know, sort of promotion or reward or anything along those lines? Um, no? no? <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, sorry. sorry. Yeah, it's, uh, if you could just grab the mic, sorry. Oh, sorry. Like, uh, yeah, sorry. Um, and just hold no, it. it's something that yeah, I said when I was speaking that today is uh, highlighted to what, uh, how, how we're in our infancy and that we haven't been considering data so much of, unfortunately, what I was speaking about was um, the practicalities of organising our day-to-day -day life. So. So okay, well, maybe that's what you're going to have to take away from, from yeah. the event. <laughs> Has anyone else got any... Yes, no? Oh, wonderful, you say. UCL, really great, uh, great initiative. I, no, I hadn't heard about it for UCL or anywhere else, and I'm, I'm really happy to hear about that. Um, and I think we could even push it a little bit further and, and ask the funders to explicitly require engagement in open science, open data, and, and data management from the early onset so that researchers that apply for grant have to demonstrate, and not by just using fancy buzzwords, but they, act, they really have to demonstrate that they mm. are good actors in that respect, otherwise they won't get the money. And the Office of Public Communication and the World Can Trust have an open research pilot project yet running at the university where they try to engage directly with Yes, and in, in that, um, in our last meeting, which we just had in September, that it was, well, it was one of the major themes, wasn't it? The lack of reward for this behaviour mm -hmm. is a major disincentive. Yeah, yeah. 
Okay, so the next question, which kind of follows on really from what Paul was asking in the last session is, is there a toolkit, and you, you guys might not necessarily be the right people within your institution to answer this question, but is there a toolkit for how to set up a network of open access data champions in an institution? So probably um, you, Jasper, are the, the closest <laughs> to that. As far as I know, there is no specific toolkit. I only know what Marta has done in Cambridge, which we're now also going to implement in uh, Delft, which is the closest thing I can I know of. Okay, which was actually was work that Rosie is established here as well. Hmm. Um, well, um, Al, do you want to talk about the the work with the RDM group, maybe that we do here at Cambridge? Well, uh, yes, I'm. I, I can. I only describe my own involvement. Yep. I'm, I'm not a practitioner, I'm not a researcher, um, and, and I would never presume to, to stand up in front of a, 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 a population of researchers and, and, and pontificate about, um, about what is good practice. Um, I've, uh, I've had some success in my position um, by trickling information out and just maintaining a little um, low level awareness um, so that the subject comes up in almost every conversation in the Institute now, um, rather than um, organising a seminar or a workshop, for example, where only, um, only the choir will turn up. Um, uh, and, and I'm trying to make sure that, that I just introduce little references to concepts that we're talking about here today in, in almost all the emails that I distribute to the, the entire population in the Institute. Um, uh, and, and I found that, that, that a successful approach. Um, Yeah, and that, I guess that's part of the issue, isn't it? There's a lot of, I don't like the word stakeholders, but stakeholders in the, in the game. So we do have lots of people who have an engagement and there's that sort of hierarchy of data management and who does what in the process and like cre creating it in the first place through to management and um, curating of it and then the preservation of it at the end. And that's where different people do these jobs. Um, the next question is one that comes back to um, some of the other discussions we've already had about how can we avoid ownership of data being taken over by commercial interests? Okay, we've already had the E word, Voldemort, <laughs> has already been spoken of today, um, but does anybody have any comment on that? Well, the, uh, within the faculty I work, this is um, more or less a little bit of an issue when we don't know how severe it is, but when, uh, when I talk to research about their contracts and they, walk and they work with commercial da uh, data from commercial partners, you start talking about who owns this data, and as I briefly showed in the presentation as well, they don't know. And this is not just you know PhD student, students filling in, I'm not sure if I don't know. This is also people higher up the academic uh, chain. So. Um, it, my advice is then would be um, make sure that it's in your contract. Of course, if you get research data from a commercial partner, it's going to be owned by that commercial partner. But if you want to make your research reproducible, you need to have, figure out how to do that even though you don't own the data. And that's through making well, the right contract at the beginning. Okay. Um, so I, I don't know how many of you work with your technology transfer operators, but I found that this is probably like the legal aspect that has to do with uh, technology transfer to some extent. And um, we're not very familiar with data as a research object that we could protect or capitalize on or in any way, which is good in a way because that means uh, as an open activist, you can argue that you know, it should be open by default. But at the same time, I think they have a lot of know-how on, on legal aspects. And working with them and agreeing on an institutional policy uh, would, would help the scientists actually understand better. I, can, uh, I don't see how libraries only can deal with this issue because they, they do want uh, just knowledge uh, dissemination uh, and management for the uh, IT. Do you want to speak, Laura? Yeah. Um, I think we need to be very careful here in terms of legal, who owns the data, um, legal aspects of the data and sharing the data. Sharing the data on the, an open license has a legal label attached to it. Um, but, and, and all this will all depend on different institutions that have different rules. Uh, but maybe my piece of, advi piece of advice to a kind of view that's so subversive in the system is make sure that when you write your grants, 
uh, yeah, when you write your grants, it's liquid grants, and when they are eventually accepted, hopefully. Make sure that you say that the software that you write will be released in an open source um, license, or the data that you, you, you will produce and will share will be released in an open license. So if, yeah, assuming that's what you want to do, you know, there is a kind of a, a document that binds you with the, the funder and, and often the, the inquiry. So that is, might be a way for me as a researcher to, kind of to push my open agenda in parallel with possible legal science. Okay, so um, this I think this comes back to the reward in some ways, but the question is how can we convince administrators to offer enough time, money and support for researchers to be better at data management? We could potentially just stop that sentence at um, researchers, which is just I've offered enough time, money and support for researchers, full stop, but we're actually asking in this case um, to be better at data management. So it's a matter of convincing administrators. What, what are some arguments that you think might be might not fall on deaf ears? Yeah, Claire? Um, uh, in, in my very small <laughs> experience, um, we've uh, done quite a lot on focusing on those who, in that the benefits from data management in itself, it is improving the data and the efficiencies within the office. And so um, that has uh, uh, picked up the, our manager's ears there. Um, Yes, so improving uh, efficiency, yeah. yeah, so, yeah so there's, there's a cost associated with that. Uh, was on the improving our efficiency, and so there's efficiency in creating data, but there's um, so efficiency in data management creates efficiency in creating data. It's important to have that, so. Any other suggestions? Yep. Yeah, I was going to comment, like, I'm more trying to convince researchers that they should invest all of this, and I'm not sure it's going to be administration's responsibility to do it for them. So, I think the administration should go one step with the researcher uh, if they're really a serious researcher. Um, I think taking away the science quality from the researchers and putting on the administration and asking them to share the quantity is certainly not a good strategy. So I think that's a good idea. And that comes back to what Al was saying before about not wanting to presume to go and speak to the research community in that context. It is their responsibility to to take ownership of this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah? I do think there are some things that the administration can do to help streamline the process for researchers. For example, providing a library of templates and anything that, that will help speed up the process of uh, engaging with, with mm. um, the sort of documents that we're talking about tonight. Yeah, yeah. It, is administrators the same as management? Can I read it like that or not? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Okay. So I think that it's, it is quite important to have your administration on board then because if you don't have your administration and you're trying to convince somebody and their, uh, their team leader or their department head is not convinced of the added value of good research data management and they will be, uh, they will be viewed, their time investment will not be worth it according to their quote unquote boss and if that goes all the way up the chain to your say dean of your faculty who is not interested or doesn't view added value of research data management will be very hard to enact that cultural change that you want from the bottom up. So while management doesn't necessarily, or administrators I think, don't necessarily need to be active, they need to see the added value or be uh, convinced of the added value of that. And from then on, you can start building it from the bottom up. So what we're saying then is that it is a researcher's responsibility to take ownership of that, but to in order for them to do that, we're not trying to ask them to, to, to try and individually work this out for themselves, that we should be able to provide support like templates and so on. And in order to provide that support, we then would need to provide um, finance for people to do that part. And to get the money to do that, we then need to make an argument about efficiency, really. Because it, if you're talking about senior administration, it comes down to money every single time. That's the only thing they want to know about. I think the other thing that helps you make that case, and it comes back to the previous uh, question a little bit is that you have to convince the institution of the value that is in their data yep. and then they have to assert their rights over that data um, and, and want to, you know, they'll, they'll put their, their money where their mouth is if they, if they can see the value in it then they will give the reporting to us and then we don't have any problems. And then sometimes it might be a disaster that actually pred predicates that 
in that you know something yeah. disappears and then it has to be reproduced. That's very costly. Yeah, or somebody gets sued. <laughs> or that. <laughs> um, okay. Now this is a good question because we are of course talking in a in a nice little bubble, which is academia. Um, so this question is: Should we also look for possible solutions and good best practices outside academia? And perhaps if you know of any, maybe you can describe them. So we've got lots of lots of nodding over there in the cow. Sorry, then. Just to set myself up as a pantomime buddy again. Just to be heard on the live stream. Sorry, if you can yeah. Just sure. Have it sorry. Like um, uh, an example that came up in the conversation earlier was about um, a pharmaceutical company, for example, where um, the um, uh, in in many aspects of the good data management, they, they're, they're 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 achieving 100% success by complete top-down control. Um, and an iron fist, um, <coughs> uh, and it, it raises a question here: wh What's more important, that we achieve 100% compliance, or we achieve 50% compliance but a much higher level of happiness with the arrangement? Mm -hmm. Very good. So, come in. <coughs> so um, I actually got into open data via the Open Knowledge Foundation, and I think there's been uh, communities active in promoting open data all over the place, and especially in government and uh, uh, industry for uh, at least 10, 15, 20 years. And I was so surprised that academia didn't really pick up on, on their mm -hmm. good community uh, habits and their techniques to lobby, uh, to engage people. Uh, uh, and uh, I think we should look at these communities much, much more. Um, so so how much do you think? I'm thinking about what you're describing. So this is something that's a good resource that other industries have taken up, and you're describing environments which are commercial where it's very much controlled. How much do you think the resistance to this whole idea is because academi uh, academics do love to, to chant the academic freedom line, which you know is used for all sorts of banners, but that the idea that academia is actually a bunch of invisible colleges and therefore to have centralised control like that is something that is actually quite actively resisted. Do you think that that might be a factor here? Complete blank. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. No? Yes? An interesting crossover starting to develop, though, in, in the Garden Institute, for example. Um, many of our PIs are starting to become involved in entrepreneurial um, uh, ventures, and the university is very supportive of all this. Mm -hmm. And now, the subject of patents and privacy and, and, um, and money is, uh, is a big factor in, in um, decisions that we'll make about how open the data should be. But what about research data management as a as a thing, like, I mean, we're, we're talking about open data, which is its own issue, and it's not probably part of a lot of commercialized commercial work, but good data management is part of commercial work because you otherwise you just fail. You're not a good company. So why are we not looking to those companies who are doing good data management for ways of doing data management? Or is that because we're academics and we can just reinvent the wheel? I mean, this is my, my question. Yeah? Well, my experience is basically, as you said, academics reinvent the wheel there. But our IT manager in the faculty, he loves to talk about um, all the problems he encounters when there's a new project and there are guidelines within the university about how to purchase IT equipment. And there's a few, lots of examples about researchers that are not even going to IT to, to buy their, their equipment. And the same goes for these practices, I think, that they don't want to be burdened by the rules and procedures, and that comes down to their academic freedom. They won't just want to move fast and do their own thing rather than be bogged down in an administration or bureaucratic mix. Do you have something to say? Grab the um, I think sometimes when we copy <coughs> models of good practice, we don't. We copy technological models. I think we yeah. copy systems. Sorry, I think we copy systems rather than rather than, I can't see how close <laughs> it is, um, we copy um, people's technology rather than people's ways of doing stuff. Uh, and I think that the technology, is, is I think we ought to learn from other things that we've done. And that I, I don't think techno technology is the answer. I think it's involved in the answer. But I think if, we s if our soft systems are good enough, then the te technology will fall into place afterwards. Uh, I think in, in our institution, Austin, research data is seen as a problem of where to put it rather than a problem how, of how to manage it. And I think that where to put it is the last and least thing we need to worry about. Yeah. So both of you showing interest, do you want um, Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Technology is not an issue. Um, I just wanted to add two comments to what was said before. Um, 
to some extent, there is a lack of standardization, which is good. Um, but lack like, like of standardization in, in the sense that you know we have different data, different models, different views. So there is no size fit, fits all. So it's very difficult to get kind of one one system, like in general or even in a department. But I think another point related to that is that the war reward system in academia is against re it is pro uh, promotes reinventing the wheel. You know, it's all about novelty, and, and so to some extent, that's how academics and researchers. Um, you know, see their world. That's how they they get promotion. That's how they value their work. It's about you know novel things. So maybe you know, that also explains a little bit the difficulty. Is that you, Frank? Did you want to say something? Luke, sorry. Did you want to say something? No. Okay. So the next question is: Should we ask publishers to include data in the peer review process? Academics would be forced to manage their data well if they knew it will be reviewed. Um, just a comment on that. This does happen every now and then for us. We get a request for um, data that has been put into our repository and not yet released, but the uh, author wants it to be able to be seen by a reviewer. Now, clearly by doing that, it's not a closed peer review process. It becomes an open peer review process, even if it was not supposed to be. Um, so that's just something to think about. But what, what do people consider about this idea about asking publishers to insist that data is part of the peer review process? What are the implications, perhaps? I mean, I would hope that journals are actually researchers, mm -hmm. right? I mean, uh, the editors are, or should be researchers, uh, the reviewers are, or should be researchers. So at the end, it's, it's back to the researchers. <laughs> and uh, I liked, um, so I invited Cassie to, to talk to Lausanne a couple of months ago, and she said, uh, I would never review a manuscript if the data was not available. And if you tell, if you have enough people telling this, enough people, uh, at the end, everybody will have to disclose everything. Uh, um, so, I mean, I'm trying to convince my researchers that one day they'll be facing reviewers for, for whom it's going to be default, and that day their paper is going to be rejected. So, uh, I think that there will be, I'm pretty optimistic, me talking, there will be a, a better circle. Uh, uh, so, the journals per se uh, can do whatever they want, but uh, I think it's the researchers behind the journal. Do others have opinions on this? Uh, I think I think it, I think it would be a good thing because um, a lot of researchers just want their research result to be published, and if the publisher are going to make it mandatory to also add your data, then the the way they will um, promote their own academic work, which is now through publications, which um, the the journals have impact factors and how many and how many times you are cited, all are important by how your academic work is valued. If those journals start requiring you to add your data, then it becomes more of the ingrained in the already na in the process that's already in place in the academic world. So I think it'd be a good thing. Thank you. Okay, Sorry, that was me just whispering to myself. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's just, uh, it's completely off topic, maybe, but. Um, uh, it almost uh, brings to me, uh, as coming back from an archaeological background, like the question of what is data? And so here we're talking about peer-reviewed data, um, and that would be presumably the result of a, a test and an analysis. But uh, the archaeological data is, a, um, is of, uh, say, two main stages. The recording of the, uh, the site, which then is all the images, all the primary data, and then... Um, and then to the next stage, which would be the analysis stage, which then uh, would include multiple tests, I suppose, and multiple mm -hmm. results. And, uh, and then that all gets pulled together. So I suppose what I wanted to just, uh, suppose, what's my point? Is that, that, that um, how would then, in the archaeological, was it, I'm throwing a question back. There you go, it's right. Uh, <laughs> how in the archaeological uh, community would that then work for review of uh, uh, the, uh, the data set and so it can't just uh, go attached to a journal it is in an archive and then if it is if your test is uh, the destruction if your initial data comes from a destruction of site how do you test that this comes back I think so in some ways to the question about using social media as data like if you get a Twitter a sort of set of Twitter feeds that you're doing an analysis of 
there is problems with reproducibility because if you then got the same set supposedly from you know date X to Y, that is not the same set because some people may have, have deleted some <coughs> of the tweets and so you can never actually reproduce the original data. And it's a similar sort of, even though it's a completely different thing, it's the same kind of problem. But I, I guess the answer to that question is if, if that information is made available and if the images are made available and so on, it, it, it does give the opportunity for the reviewer to, to at least have sight of it and not just take the word of the author mm -hmm. that that is the case. Yeah, I suppose it's just, it's a, that's a, I was just talking about envisioning suddenly like, uh, envisioning suddenly the data set being so much bigger and mm. then you, and then, and then, but yeah, and so do, for any data set to just go along with the journal, how would that work? Hmm. So they're opening up all sorts of questions about where data is kept and how it's kept into the future. Anybody else burning on that one? I think. Yeah, I, I hate to, I hate to quote Hefke as an example of best practice, and it's the second <laughs> time today I've done this. <laughs> but if you could just um, hold the mic up. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, <laughs> the, um, the the question they ask in the ref is where is the research and. Uh, the, what they they called research an, an investigation leading into an in, leading to an insight effectively shared and if you think about your effective sharing as your output the the uh, the investigate what you're doing with the data is showing how your investigation supports your insight mm. and I think in any discipline you can do that but it does it does translate in different ways in different disciplines and in some it, and it's it's more direct in some than others. Okay, so the next one's a binary question, really. Um, so it's saying which is more effective, and well, we might go from the end to the to from that end to this end, and everyone can answer it. Which which way you think it goes? So which is more effective for making the case for research data management? A costly disaster coupled with reputational damage, <laughs> or the kudos of being seen to do good things, good research. So so we, we, and this is an opinion <laughs> for you guys. So it's up to you. And there's no right answer here. So which one do you think would be more effective? Making, making the case to who though, Paul? That's a good question. Who are we making the case to in this scenario? Uh, probably senior management, people who make work. Okay, money. It's a money people. All right. I think you've just answered your own <laughs> question. But um, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> <laughs> But the, the, the <laughs> let's see what the panel have to say. Which, which way do you think so you vote? The best effect is to just don't let it touch the table. If it's touching the table, it's too far away from you. Okay. <laughs> um, I mean, just just to come back to the money, I think it's a get, it's it's an opportunity cost. So there's just so much money for research today, and uh, whether it's increasing or decreasing, you know, it depends on, on where you live. But uh, I think nobody can give more money for this. I think it's just we need to reallocate some money from somewhere into this. Uh, that's just for the, for the finances. Uh, now, which one is most effective? I mean, I've seen people that have really good research data management after a disaster. Uh, I doubt you get the same effectiveness from uh, just goodwill uh, or the sake of showing up. But uh, I would hope that maybe in the future, you don't need to wait until the disaster to, to end up there. Unfortunately, I think a good disaster and a drop in reputation of a quite big university would, would be a really, really good push for data management. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really sorry, but I think that's... Now, if anything happens at Cambridge over the next week or two, <laughs> <laughs> nothing to do with this conversation. <laughs> Yeah, without a doubt, a costly disaster. We'll, uh, we'll sh make sure that management starts thinking about how to prevent, uh, well, another one of those events. <laughs> um, it's, uh, the costly disaster definitely makes the case with man for management, but what management think does not directly determine what researchers do. So you've got to make both cases. What, what they said, basically. I am, uh, realistically, I, I imagine um, the great reward for researchers is not in, in public good, but more to do with the excitement of the discovery. Um, so I think far more impact would be from um, the, the, the expense of disaster. Um, the, I suppose uh, in my experience, I would uh, say it was a potential disaster, but um, uh, the, I, it didn't for us, it, didn't even, it wasn't a disaster, just for something very costly. And so, yeah, I'd go with the disaster, even though I'd like to go with 
Six out of six. I'm looking for a volunteer to have a cough for disaster. <laughs> <laughs> Not Cambridge in the next two weeks. Um, okay. <laughs> Three weeks time. <times> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this might need to be our last question. It, it, it is, if good data management means reproducible research, if that's what we mean by good data management, why do we need so much effort to engage researchers re with research data management? Isn't reproducible research the goal anyway? That's an interesting question. Is reproducible research the goal? Or is publication in a fancy pants journal to get a promotion the goal? I don't know. Yep. Sorry, are we talking about good research or successful academia? Good question. I th well, I think this, I think we're here. It's a, again like the previous question. It's a it's a query about uh, pragmatism over hearts and minds. But um, well, would would you say reproducible research is the goal? <coughs> it depends who you ask and what. But but I guess the problem that these two are not aligned is the, the reward system that favors successful uh, academia, su successful in the frame of being a good ac academic, and that doesn't really align with, not necessarily align with, with good research. You'll be a good, successful academic if you get prizes, um, if you get grants, if you get papers. Um, you will not be considered a successful academic if you do reproducible research and you, you share everything openly. Any other thoughts on this? Rather depressing bit to end on, really. But so I, 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 I'm assuming that reproducibility is a, a, an assumption rather than a goal. Um, uh, I've completely forgotten what I was going to say next. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, well, I'll come, come back to yeah, okay, you need to be thinking. Kind of, does anybody else have an opinion on this? I mean, I'll follow up on this. I think it's a good comment. Uh, people say, uh, oh, this is, we, we're going to invest way too much in this, uh, and not all the research will be reproduced anyway. And I'm thinking, you know, we invest so much into writing so many papers that are not read anyway. So mm -hmm. the goal is to have a potential reproducibility of your research, but it doesn't need to, it has to be reproduced. And I think that the natural selection of, of, of good or useful science being reproduced is something we should, we should aim for, not for like reproducibility of, of everything. Mm. It should be potentially reproduced, but not mm -hmm. necessarily. So Let's come back. Yes. So I remember the question I was going to ask, in fact, which was, um, I, I'm interested in the idea about whether reproducibility should be um, something that's, that's applied to um, data only, or, or should, the, um, should it not start with the experiment, um, with the actual research itself? Um, I'm slightly concerned about that, well, not concerned, but it's an interesting uh, question is, um, the more data we share, the more effectively that data is shared, um, will will an assumption be made that the experimental work that preceded that was all accurate and precise and properly conducted? Mm. Um, could we end up sharing, effectively, bad data? Yes, and, and there, are, there is some work, I, I presume that most of the people in this room are aware of this, there's some work that's being done to sort of break down the research process and have a peer review of different parts of the research process. So in some disciplines now, you can have your methodology peer reviewed where the journal will then say, we will publish your results regardless of what they are because the method is strong. Um, and so even if you have null results, the fact that you've put together a good protocol is itself published worthy, in which case you could feel confident in what, what produced the data. But that's a, yeah, it's, a, it's sort of taking it another step back in the chain, which is really what we need to start doing, I think. Um, there's one final small comment. I think um, generally, for the majority of us, the ideology is always there, but it's the, the, the once you get into your research, it's the stress and the pressures that mean that you start uh, chipping off those corners. Yeah. Well, final comment as well. We have a discussion with researchers about, okay, so what's the goal? Is it to reproduce my research? They often say, so, but what if I generate a lot of research, what of data that I then pick from to do my research? There's a lot of data I didn't use. What am I going to do with that? So it's not only reproducibility of scientific results, it's general care for all the data that you generate and what do you do with that. If you only select and use a portion of that, you can still publicly share the, all the data that you've used or generated throughout your project. Excellent. So what we're, what we're advocating is that we should allow the data to run free with the wildebeest mm -hmm. and then anything can come and pick it up and work with it. Um, we, but that is all we have time for now. I'd, I'd just like to acknowledge that this is a group of people who were very much on the fly asked to be part of this. Some of them literally only about an hour and a half ago. So I think they've done an excellent job and please thank our wonderful panel.